as Hans Jonas writes, the prophecy of doom is made to avert its coming, and it would be the height of injustice later to deride the alarmists, because it did not turn out so bad after all. To have been wrong, maybe they merit. And that's the last uh, point of my presentation, the most difficult conceptual one, um, but also it's fun uh, from an intellectual point of view. The doomsday paradox, and here I'm reversing time myself, you will observe that we are dealing here with two prophets of doom, both of them are were Jews or Hebrews, and, had the, and they had the same name, except well, uh, not in English, of course, but it's a problem in English. Uh, Jonah, the biblical prophet of the 8th century before Christ, and Hans Jonas, the prophet of doom of the 20th century. The doomsday paradox is as follows. Making the, pers making the perspective of catastrophe credible. Again, you remember, we, the problem is that we do not believe what we know. The catastrophe is before us. We, so we have to render the presence of the catastrophe before us visible and credible. That requires that one to increase the ontological force of its encryption in the future. The foretold suffering and death will inevitably occur like an inexorable destiny. And the present must conserve the memory of the future. The mind can project itself beyond the catastrophe. Speaking of the event in the future perfect sense, there exists a moment from the standpoint of which one will be able to say the catastrophe will have taken place. When you think of, uh, this is a grammatical remark, but I think it's very important. There is a tense called perfect, um, um, the perfect, uh, the future birth, uh, what do you call it? Perfect, future birth. When you come, I will have finished eating. This is a stroke of, uh, actually we use in French, we use this form much more often, <coughs> and in much more cases than in English. That's interesting in itself. This stance is absolutely a stroke of genius because it allows us to transform the future into a past. And what happens when you transform a future event into a past event? Well, a past event is in principle fixed. It happened, so nobody can change the fact that it happened. But a future event, it's before us. If you have a conception of time of the future as branching out, the future is not fixed. But thanks, or oh, thanks, well, thanks is maybe too, 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 too precise a word. Thanks to the, this uh, form, grammatical form, the future perfect, we transform the fixed, the openness of the future into the fixity of the past. When you come, I will have finished in. It will, it will belong to the past. Although my finishing eating is, when I'm saying this now, in the future. This is very important. But remember what uh, Anders uh, said in his parable of the flood. The day after tomorrow. So we, we have two futures here. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Except the day after tomorrow, the catastrophe will have taken place and there will be no problem. The day after tomorrow, the flood will be something that will have been. But now, the paradox of the following. If this task is too well carried out, you will have lost sight of its purpose, which is precisely to raise people's awareness and spur them into action so that the catastrophe may not occur. Remember in Anders' parable, let me help you build an ark so that this may become false. This is a paradox. Well, this paradox is certainly one of the oldest paradoxes in the history of humanity. You find it in myths, in religions, in literature, and high-ground of love. And one possible expression of this paradox is the case of the murderous, murderous judge. The murderous judge neutralizes, that is, assassinates, criminals of whom it is written 
that they are going to commit a crime. Okay? It's written that someone is going to commit a crime and you neutralize him just before he commits it. That doesn't remind you of something? Quite mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, very good, but <laughs> fiction, let's talk in terms of fiction. Well, first, yes, but you may not be familiar with that, it's at the core of one of the philosophical tales that Voltaire wrote to make fun of Heidegger's uh, metaphysics. It's called Zadig, and um, uh, a very bright science fiction, American science fiction writer called Philip Dick wrote a short story based on Zadig called Minority Report. American director called Steven Spielberg made a film out of this. Also, I'm sure many of you have seen this movie. No? It's also the Terminator. First no. Terminator. Yes, of course, of course, of course, yes. So this is, uh, this is a Minority Report, the film. The future can be seen, murder can be prevented, the guilty punished before the crime is committed. The system is perfect, it's never wrong until it comes up to me. So in that field, uh, Tom Cruise is the chief of police at that time, the police that can anticipate the future thanks to three creatures called pre cops three kind of sirens of women making a tool or something with a lot of nanotechnology. Yeah. And, um, and the uh, potential criminals are neutralized, except that they are not criminals, they haven't committed anything. And there is a dialogue between the uh, three of them, uh, between the, the police, police one of them says, let's not kill ourselves. We are arresting individuals who have broken no law. The other one says, but they will. But the commission of the crime itself is absolute metaphysics. That's in the movie. I mean, speak. The word mm -hmm. metaphysics is used in that speaker of the movie. <laughs> and the precogs see the future, and they are never wrong. But then comes with her. But it's not the future if you stop it. Isn't that a fundamental product? And Tom Cruise comes up and says, yes, it is. <laughs> Okay, that's that's a part. Minority, um, but you know that's also you could say that's also the Jonah part. Of it. Jonah was asked by his God to prophesy the fall of Nineveh, and Jonah doesn't reply and said he leaves. You know the, the rest of the story. It's only at the end that we, we understand why Jonah didn't do his job as a professional predictor because God asked him once again. To prophesy the fall of Nineveh, and now Jonah knows what, what he has, to, I mean, the price he has to pay if he doesn't comply. And what happens is exactly what jo Jonah had predicted would happen had he predicted the fall of Nineveh in the first time. The first time. That is, the Ninevites repent, the Jewish God forgives them, and the prophecy doesn't come true. And Jonah didn't want to be a false prophet. Is the very fact of making public the prophecy renders the prophecy false. That's a part. Intuition tells us that paradox comes from a temporal looping that should, but that does not occur between the earlier provision and the future event. The future is predicted, here it's a, a catastrophe. And this prediction made public triggers a reaction which may render causally impossible, which may causally render impossible the coming true of the prophecy. Now, this very idea of a loop between the future and the past makes no sense in our ordinary metaphysics as shown by the metaphysical structure of prevention. What does that mean, uh, prevention? When you predict, in order to avoid it, that the catastrophe is on the way, and you stop it. This prediction doesn't have the status, the status of a prevision in the street sense of the term. The prediction doesn't claim to say what the future will be, but simply what the future would have been if people had not paid attention. So looping is not a condition in this instance. The predicted future 